Today's podcast is brought to you by Visa, who wants to know where would you like to be? Whether you're a super fan getting ready for a game or a food truck owner feeding hungry fans, Visa wants to help you pursue your passion with a simple and unwavering vision to be the best way to pay and be paid for everyone everywhere. They know that every Visa transaction is a promise and they want to provide you with the most secure and easy payment experience possible. That's why they're continuing to make innovations from tapping to pay to pushing money directly to your debit card so you can get to where you would like to be. Visa, everywhere you want to be. Hey y'all, Uncle Jimmy here. When you speak for yourself, you're forced to think for yourself. And when you think for yourself, the sports world looks different. In order to enjoy this podcast and this show, you need to have the courage to look at the world from alternative points of view and not be offended when you disagree. Speak for Yourself isn't your Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram feed. SFY tells you what you need to hear and not what you want to hear. So, welcome aboard, buckle up, and enjoy the ride. We start in Carolina. All right, two things happened yesterday that make me even more convinced the Carolina Panthers are the right home for Heisman Trophy winner Joe Burrow, the Barry Sanders of college quarterbacks. One... The Panthers hired LSU passing game coordinator Joe Brady to be their new offensive coordinator. LSU head coach Ed Orgeron brought Brady to Baton Rouge in 2019 to design, install, and coordinate the offense that elevated Burrow from a solid 2018 starter to the greatest quarterback, college quarterback we've ever seen. Under Brady's guidance, Burrow went from 16 to 60 passing TDs faster than the Ferrari Marcellus used to drive. Hmm. And two... <laughs> Carolina all-world middle linebacker Luke Keekley retired at the age of 28. It's time for a rebuild in the Carolinas. There's no reason to bring 30-year-old Cam Newton back and try to back into the playoffs. Without Keekley and with longtime tight end Greg Olson likely to join Keekley in retirement, it's time for the Panthers to push out the old and bring in the new. It's the perfect setup for the Panthers to go all in on acquiring the rights to select Burrow at the top of the 2020 draft. That means Burrow needs to tell his home state Cincinnati Bengals that he doesn't want to play for penny-pinching owner Mike Brown. The Bengals have the number one pick. They're expected to use that pick on Burrow, who grew up in Athens, Ohio, three hours from Cincy. Cincinnati is ready to move on from quarterback Andy Dalton. But, as I explained yesterday, Joe Burrow should have the courage and foresight to do what Eli Manning and John Elway did. Before the 2004 draft, Eli refused to sign with the Chargers and demanded they trade him to the Giants. In exchange for Eli, the Chargers received the fourth pick in the 2004 draft, Phillip Rivers, the Giants' third-round pick that year, and their first and fifth-round picks in 2005. Before the 1983 draft, John Elway refused to play for the Colts, in exchange for Elway, the Colts received the fourth-round pick in 1983, guard Chris Hinton, second-year quarterback Mark Herman, and Denver's first-round pick in 1984, which turned into guard Ron Solt. The Colts got ripped off. The Chargers got a fair exchange for Eli. Here's what the Bengals should ask for and receive for the rights to draft Joe Burrow. Cam Newton, Carolina's first and second picks in this year's draft, and Carolina's first-round pick next year. That's a starting quarterback, the seventh pick in this year's draft, and likely a top 10 pick next season as Carolina rebuilds. Maybe the Miami Dolphins can offer Cincinnati more for Burrow. The Dolphins own the fifth, 18th, and 26th picks in this year's draft. But does Burrow want to play in Miami? Is LSU's passing game coordinator going to be Miami's offensive coordinator? And maybe the Dolphins are more interested in Alabama quarterback Tua Tung Viola. Carolina makes the most sense for Burrow. The Panthers have the richest owner in football, David Tepper. The richest owners believe in acquiring the best prospects on the market. Look at the way the Clippers owner, Steve Ballmer, pursued and acquired Kawhi Leonard. The retirement of Luke Kuechly and the hiring of Joe Brady signal the Panthers have rightfully zeroed in on Joe Burrow. All right, joining the desk now are Fox Sports NFL <coughs> analyst T.J. Husmanzada and former Patriots offensive lineman Rich Ornberger. Marcellus, get us rolling. Should the Panthers go all in on the pursuit of Joe Burrow? Absolutely not. Nope, not at all. Uh, give you a simple example. When I'm out with the wife and kids, they always look at stuff. They say, can I have that? And I always come back with the same response. How much it costs? And you know what? In this situation, it's going to cost too damn much to go get Joe Burrow. If you're the Carolina Panthers, think about it. They're seventh 
in draft order. You know who's right before them? Chargers and Dolphins. So your Eli example, your John Elway example, not analogous because when you call the Cincinnati Bengals say, we want to trade up. You know who's on call waiting? The Dolphins, the Chargers, sitting there driving that price up. So it's going to be absurd what you have to give up. And what are you going to get in return? Think about it. Cincinnati is incentivized to keep Joe Burrow for two major reasons. One, he's a local kid who has this much talent. Sponsors already called, endorsers already called. Hey, Cincy, you have a face of the franchise. But more importantly, Kyler Murray got $8 million last year as the number one pick. That's cheap for a good quarterback. That's cheap for a great quarterback. And if Joe Burrow is worth his salt, he's going to be a good to great quarterback. Wouldn't you want to keep him five years, eight million every single year, face of the franchise, sponsorships, endorsements, and that price tag is going to be too much for Carolina move up. All of that adds up to, hey, baby, hey, kids, sorry, can't get it. Cost too much. Let's move on. Before y'all hop in, the only thing I say will drive the price down is if Joe Burrow says, trade me to Carolina, that'll drive the price down. Now, should they go all in? Yeah, they should go all in. And you go, when you talking... Joe Brady, sign an extension with LSU, and then a week later you leave? If you can bring the quarterback that pretty much got me this job or I made him the first pick, however you want to look at it, you have to go however much it costs. The price can never get too high. What? It can, when, if you can get a quarterback that can play for your franchise for the next 10 to 15 years and take your franchise the highest that it's never been, you have to do it. And... If you got to give up two first-round picks or a player, it's worth it. Two first-round, that's maybe this year. And then you, you a look first at, and a second. Outside of Christian McCaffrey, you look at the Carolina's first-round pick, DJ Moore, what has he done? Uh, nothing. Curtis Samuel, what has he done? Nothing. So these first-round picks, they're not guaranteed to be players. You hope and expect that Burrow can be that. I want him to form that tandem again with Joe Brady and Carolina. Th- if I don't have a quarterback that can do what Joe Burrow can do, and I'm Joe Brady, is my offense really that dynamic? Mm. I don't think so. Look, when you use the term all in, it's a poker term. And what all in means you have supreme confidence that you have the winning hand, that you know what you're about to do next is going to conquer the board in front of you. Whoever has their pot emptied, I'm taking it home with me. So if you are going to go all in on Joe Burrow, You better be sure that Joe Burrow's all in on you. Hmm. You better be sure that everybody in that Carolina stance is all in on Joe Burrow because dissension will kill this deal. Hmm. You can't have a single naysayer in the building. Should have kept Cam. You can't have that. Hmm. Now, Cam Newton, he can move on and have a fairly nice career if he's traded to a team who's in a ready-bake situation just a quarterback away. Now, what happens if Joe Burrow comes in and struggles and you just leverage your future for him? If there's anybody in that building... That's what happens when you go all in. You take a chance. You got to take a chance. But the reward, the boom or bust reward of this, in the middle of, like you just described, a complete rebuild, taking away two cornerstones offensively and defensively and Newton and Keekly, is this really the time to say, okay, now we go all in? This is the perfect time. Did you watch no, Joe Burrow? I watched Joe Burrow at the college level. How many players have Ooh, we known the it. number one locks at the college say level it. walk into an NFL facility and Hello. all of a sudden they but, can't make it work? But, You've but never Rich, seen this before. I'm Go ahead, Jason. I'm no, sorry. But Rich and Marcellus. Yeah. You do know, like, Carolina's showing its hand. in turn, Hiring Joe Brady, mm. to me, tells you what they think of Joe Burrow. And again... And to me, it's proof of why Joe Burrow should not want to play in Cincinnati. Because if I'm Cincinnati and I got the number one pick and I'm going with Joe Burrow, I beat Carolina to the punch and I hire Joe Brady. That, to me, is why I don't get like Brady the Cincinnati Get him, Brady, then tag me in, baby. Okay, get okay, first, baby. okay, okay. How about this, though? Isn't this the chicken or egg conversation? What came first? What was great first? Did Burrow make Brady or Brady make Burrow? So you catch some of the LSU winning fever in Carolina without having to take the risk on the quarterback. I got the OC. I believe that he was able to take a guy who was a transfer and transform his career into the greatest college football player we've ever seen. I don't... One of them. Y'all got to... 
y- y'all? Y'all got to get out of this. Is <laughs> the player. Hey, I, you give me the best game plan in the world. If I can't execute it, is your game plan really that good? It's not. Well, you I give me with all that. the information. Bel- Belichick proves that game plan may trump actual. Yeah, if you get a study talent. guide before the test. I, yeah. I, I, all I want to tell you is <laughs> y'all, y'all, y'all really are misconstruing the hire of what Joe Brady means to Carolina. Joe Brady, in his own words, says, "I'm about a system that fits my players." So Will Greer, Kyle Allen, and maybe Cam Newton should smile at this. But I'm telling you guys right now, Joe Brady doesn't want Joe Burrow as much as y'all think. Because his fast track to being a head coach is not showing a marriage to Joe Burrow and making that a 2.0 experience in the NFL. It's to grab any quarterback and say, my system applied to you can make it work. Because he won't be the head coach in Carolina. He's going to be the head coach somewhere else. You can't sell marriage and relationship. You have to sell system. So he's actually incentivized to grabbing Kyle Allen, Will Greer, and saying, watch this. Let me make this happen. And when that you. backfires, then what to his oh, wow. role to a head coaching you will, job? You will bet more on Joe Burrow One. Than, than, than Cam Newton, Cal Allen, and Will Greer? Hell yes. Oh, yeah. Oh. No question. All right, y'all got no that. question. With a post it? Hold on. No. Hold on. Y'all forgetting how y'all got Joe Burrow. Y'all went all in. This is a Pokes team. Two retirements, no Cam Newton probably, and then you're going to sit there and say, we don't have assets, first round picks, second round picks, but we're going to be better with Joe Burrow. How about this? It's not about I would be more in favor of them going after Teddy Bridgewater in free agency than drafting Joe Burrow. A proven commodity at the NFL level. A guy who can helm a ship. We've seen him do it with two franchises now. Because of cost. It's going to cost too much. There is no cost too high. And, And let me say this about about the point of he needs to develop other quarterbacks. and bl- That, to me, is a coach whose ego is out of control, that my system is, is bigger than the players and just give me anybody. Belichick deserves to have that ego. Joe Brady, he better be humble as hell. Well, he already and, has said that well, the no, system no, no, applies to it, others. Be, well, and I get that's That's... Right, say that just that's in coach case talk. they don't Great. get, they, that's they don't get Joe Burrow. No, that's no, just... no. But, but to me, ego is like Sean McVay. I created Jared Goff, and therefore we're going to pay him $34 million a year. And that blows up in your face. You better go out and get the best players that you can think of and have and coach them. Hold and again, I, I just I think your guy Steve Ballmer's already laid the blueprint, man. When you got this kind of money, you want the but, best. But, oh, and oh, you oh, go oh, out and do yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and he put all kinds uh, of pieces oh. together to get Kawhi. And I see this Joe mm. Brady move as the first step in like, there's a quarterback out there we want to just set the college football world on fire. He's the number one. Do you not? Do you not think that Joe that Joe Burrow is trans like a transformative quarterback? If you think that, you go no. get him. If you don't, it, you don't. No. Then who he playing with is my conversation more so than anything because I, I saw all the early good to great quarterbacks. Or you want to go to the go to Tom Brady? It was built around them as well. We're talking about defense, special teams that led those early success and championships. Let's say this about Joe Burrow. He's a tremendous talent at the level he's in. But right now, his coach is resume building. His coach just left the NFL to go to the LSU to come right back to the NFL. You think he's doing that because he's not thinking about what's next? What's next for him is not an ego play. It's called what Sean McVay did. He took an 0-7 rookie quarterback to the Super Bowl and then... In a horrible year, was nine and seven. And also, when you look at the Clippers, success. when you look at the Clippers, this Balmer and he surrounded yeah. the team with talent and everything. Think about how long it took before you could really lure a talent like Kawhi. Ooh. You Ooh. had a lot of work to do. Not a lot of city. <laughs> Hire Jerry West. Yeah. Clean house. Make moves where you su- make a surrounding cast where Kawhi will look around the building and go, yeah. This, Thank you. this looks good. This cha- looks championship ready. I'm going to go bring my new shoe deal here, and we're going to make some noise in the Western Conference. I look at what Dave Tepper do. He is on day one of the rebuild. He just had a guy retire you know at 28 years with? old. In the NFL, a franchise quarterback. Not always. And a young, and a young one. And draft oh, that's You can't win without one. That's, that's the goal oh, for everybody oh, 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 to oh, oh, land them oh, oh, a franchise oh, oh, oh. quarterback. Can you? Come on now. Well, I, we have come I, on now. That's I, the goal. Listen, it is, there is no doubt. It's the most important position in all of sports. Yeah. It's that one of the highest paid positions in all of professional America. I mean, the reason why is because of how much responsibility one man has. I understand all that. 
But you can ruin a career based off of one or two years of strife and struggle. So Burrow mm -hmm. may be the now, right guy, but this is the wrong When you time. have the type of confidence. calls. Like, <laughs> the dude is so confident. Like, Joe Burrow has a confidence and a maturity about him that he... Now, does he want to play in Cincinnati? Would he prefer to be reunited with Joe Brady? We don't know that. But these are conversations he's going to have with his, with his dad, who is a football coach. They should have an idea of what they want to do. But I'm with Jason. Carolina, you got to go all in. And you don't worry about, oh, I don't win this hand in poker. When you go all in, you feel like you got the best hand. It's going to work. And, and we're not talking about... Carolina winning next year. It's going to be the same process yeah, Arizona. never winning. <laughs> the same process Arizona's going through with Kyler Murray or any of these rookie quarterbacks. Cleveland's going through with Baker Mayfield. It's a rebuilding process. But if you can start with what you believe, and I think Joe Brady certainly believes, the best college quarterback uh, performance we've ever seen from the quarterback and a hell of a prospect, every, the consensus apparent number one pick, if you can start that rebuilding process there with his offensive coordinator, with the guy that helped make him make that magic, it's a brilliant play. It's, to me, it's obvious what Carolina's doing. And to me, I'm just if I'm Joe Brady and his dad, for a rebuilding team, uh, uh, Joe Burrow and his dad, for a rebuilding team like the Bengals, not to have made this Joe Brady move, is to me, it's just another sign like this isn't a forward thinking organization that's ever ahead of the curve. Ever. But they don't spend money. They don't think ahead of the curve. They don't act ahead of the curve. That's why I don't want to be in Cincinnati. I love whipped cream as much as the next guy, right? <laughs> uh, but I like it on I top hate of whipped cream. I'm I, like, say, I don't like it that much. <laughs> oh, really? I, you know, I, I don't hate whipped cream. Whipped cream. Whipped cream. Oh, no, you no, no. not call Hang quarterbacks on. whipped cream. You got to build the Sunday first. Look at mm. Baker Mayfield right now. And mm. he's not as talented a college quarterback mm. as the man we're talking about, Joe Burrow. But I will say this. Mm. It sort of felt like you put the whipped cream in place. We got o Odell Beckham Jr. We got Baker Mayfield. Where's your offensive line? Right. Where's where's the nuts and Cleveland's bolts of a problem's team? Not talent, it was leadership. I got one thing: the final four quarterbacks right now. It's interesting. The cheapest one is the only one doing it, basically based on his talents, and that is going to be Patrick Mahomes. The other three, let's talk about this: Aaron Rodgers, what's leading the charge? Defense, running oh, game. Rogers, Jimmy G, what's leading the charge? Defense, running game. Ryan Tannehill, what's leading the charge? Running game. Defense. But if Aaron Rodgers needed to lead the charge, he could. You keep saying that. <laughs> he could. He, 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 he could. He could. for three years. He, 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 I keep saying that. Everybody has to do taxes, and yet not everybody feels comfortable doing taxes, which doesn't seem right, especially when you consider all the amazing things these same people accomplish every day of their lives. TurboTax believes that, with the right tools and encouragement, people can be good at anything. Yes, even taxes. And to help people feel more comfortable with the tax process, TurboTax Live gives you personal access to experienced CPAs and EAs who are there for you even on nights and weekends. And they're happy to go through your return with you line by line to double check that you've done everything right. So you can be sure to get your best possible refund and feel 100% confident in your taxes. TurboTax, all people are tax people. Rich Ornberger is back, and we're joined now by Fox NFL analyst Mark Slareth. Time now for a big story. Let's return to Luke Keekley, who stunned the football world yesterday, retiring at the age of 28. Keekley has suffered several concussions in recent years, and in his retirement announcement, he said he wanted to continue playing, but that it wasn't the right decision. Keekley made seven Pro Bowls in eight seasons in the NFL. He is a surefire Hall of Famer. And he now becomes the latest star player to walk away from the game at the young age, joining the likes of Andrew Luck, Rob Gronkowski, Calvin Johnson, and Patrick Willis, among others. Question here is, is this a bad sign for football, Keekly retiring? Uh, it's good and it's bad. Uh, it, it, you're really looking at the, the dichotomy, the dynamic, really, of the job of football versus the business of football. And I think players right now are running a different mathematical equation in terms of their career. And that's great for football, the business, because you guys have now afforded players like myself and others so much in terms of platform riches that guys can leave the game early. But it's also highlighting the underbelly and the ugly part of football, which is 
is bad for your health. It's occupational hazard. There's hell to pay as soon as you cross the white line and different degrees depending on position. What Luke Keekley is saying right now is he's run an equation that maybe before his eight-year career and $63.5 million in earnings that he would have ran through all of those walls. But in the process of running through those walls, having four diagnosed concussions, has now come to a realization that his future and what he already has attained from the game is something that he has to weigh heavy. And that equation changes for every player based on what you have get gotten from the game and what you want from your life after the game. So respect to Luke Keekley and respect to the NFL for giving us this opportunity to have this luxury mm. such a young time in his career because there was a day, maybe Schlereff's day or before, where they didn't have that same luxury and they had to run through that wall just to make sure that they were okay. I think it's great for the NFL. I think there's nothing but benefit here where you can sit there and say, hey, man, I am at the top of my game. I'm one of the greatest players. I mean, you look at Luke Keekley and people say, well, he's one of the smartest football players I've ever been around. Luke Keekley's one of the smartest people I've ever been around. That guy has skill set, and he's got the ability to do whatever he wants. And the NFL has afforded him the opportunity to make that $63.5 million after eight years and say, you know what, what do I want to do? Yeah. We've never been in a place where we've been more empowered from not only a financial standpoint, but an educational standpoint. I know what I've done to my body from the neck up, you know, specifically from the neck up, most importantly, but also from the neck down. Yeah. And now I've, I have the opportunity to weigh that out. I, made, I came in and was a starter my rookie year and made 45 grand. Mm. That was in 1989, right? Yeah. I mean, so, yeah. th you don't have those opportunities. When, so uh, to me, this is a great thing. You, it should be celebrated. The league should look at something like Luke Keekly or somebody like Luke Keekly and celebrate the fact that, hey, guys, you can, be, you can come into this league and you can play for eight years and you can be set for life and then you can do whatever you want to do. And here's the beauty of Luke Keekly: When you don't get your identity in what you do for a living, when your identity comes outside of what you do for a living, because if your identity is in what you do for a living, when that gets taken away from you, you know what? You're going to struggle. Mm -hmm. It's just fact. Yep. You're going to get pink slipped, outsourced, whatever the case may be. Downsized, cut, you will struggle. But if your identity isn't in, I'm a football player, if that's not how you identify, then you can go on and do whatever you want to do. So good for the league, good for Luke Keekley. This is a great, great, this is a great to me. It's great for the league. Tagging along with what you just said, and I completely agree, I think this is good for the NFL because this isn't a bad sign. It's a sign of the times. Look, we're a woke culture now. Everybody's more aware than they were 20 years ago. I mean, when you were starting out in 89, uh. everybody had styrofoam cups. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was... We were sipping out of plastic straws. Mm -hmm. I just stayed last night in Beverly Hills. I wouldn't be caught dead with a plastic straw. <laughs> I, I mean, you would be uh, castigated in the streets. It's not the right thing to do anymore. And it's because we're all aware of consequences now. And sometimes, even for the greatest gifts, like the NFL and, and the pride that it serves communities with, and some of these players and how they serve their teams and their teammates, we understand there is a consequence attached. So if you're going to play this game at an elite level like Luke Keekley did for so many years, and you're going to benefit so greatly from the sport and the sport benefiting from your hard work as well, walking away at the right time, I think, serves the NFL correctly because we're not going to read about how he went broke. We're not going to read about how he is broke. Mm -hmm. We're going to read about how he improved his life even beyond the game and in turn improved the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got to hop on board with, with all of you and say I think it's great for the NFL. I, I, I think that it's a teachable moment, I think, for a lot of young players in, in the sense of you should realize, like, make as much money as you can, take care of that money, so that you're not beholden to the NFL for longer than your body will allow. Mm. And, and so I, I know a little bit about Luke Keekley because he's from Cincinnati, Ohio. My brother, my nephews go to the high school, St. Xavier, that uh, Luke Keekley went to. I know how that school, it's a private Catholic school, I know how they prepare young men, not just as athletes, but for participation in all of society and how they try to build young men. And so I look at football, and, and it's like we love, and a lot of people love to say the NBA is the greatest thing in the world, but I look at football and how it basically requires you to go to college and experience some form of higher education, how much you invest in it is up to you, 
But I look at Luke Kuechly from St. Xavier to Boston College to the NFL. This guy is making this decision not just because he has the wealth to move on, but because he has the intellectual wealth, he's been developed as a full person, and he can think of something else to do beyond football. Sure. This is a great story and should be role modeled for other NFL players. Yeah, um, there are two sides to this coin, and I won't gloss over the other side of the coin, which is basically an example. Uh, your NFL career is like you taking a conscious last hold of breath and going underwater for those treasures. And then you realize Luke Keekley did in eight years and some others in five years, 10 years, it's time to come up for air. Because it's hell under there. It's hard to play football. Basketball is a better job. Basketball is not a better business necessarily in totality, but to the individual, some would say it is. But the game, the job, there are 40 surgeries up here combined minimum, I think. Uh, Mark, you 27 in? 29. 29 in, I'm 10. You I've want, had four, okay. five, five. And all I wanted to let people know is... I had one. You had one? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Add it up. But it's all with love. Uh, and I think it's conditional love, and that's okay. I think there's so many times we were told as kids that if you don't love football wholeheartedly, something's wrong with you. You don't have to have unconditional love for the game. There are conditions. One of the conditions for Luke Keekley was, I have had enough of these concussions and whatever it can do to compromise me going forward. And I respect that. I, you know, I, lo I love this conversation because, you know, it's timely. We just saw two videos. One where Keekley sat in front of his camera in his linebacking room and he addressed the fan base and the ownership and his teammates mm -hmm. and really all of the membership of the NFL PA, former players in current, and said, I've done enough. I've done all I could. Mm. And tearfully stepping away from his post in the middle of that defense. We've seen another video this week of a talented, Hall of Fame probable wide receiver shouting from his doorstep at the mother of his children fighting to get back into the same league mm. in Antonio Brown. Both of these guys have suffered head trauma. One of these stories feels like it's gonna end poorly. One of these stories feels like it's gonna end well. I think it, it is a very difficult, it's a very difficult decision to make, but you have to know when it's your time to leave. It's time for Dead Dudes Dudes. Marcellus, what you got? Two big dogs right here. We ain't retiring from the game. We're going to keep it going. Three big dogs. <laughs> Come up. Come on, bird. Let's go with number three. <laughs> Not a big dog. Jimmy G with a little itty-bitty pancake right here. Keep your eyes on the quarterback, Jimmy G, looking to make a block for Debo Sam. Oh, oh, little itty-bitty pancake on <laughs> Anthony Barr. Come on, L.A. So hyped. He, he even dives in on the non-fumble. Got to stick your neck out. First thing he does, he look a little unsure he really wants some of that smoke. But he able to stand up. Anthony Barr, a linebacker. You see, then you can see him. Mm. Oh, look at that arm. Mm. Finish him. Use his throwing arm on the scorpion. And then he gets a little hype in the Aww. moment. I got to dust himself off. Whoa, that was work. Uh, Jimmy G, I see you getting in the trenches right there. Number three, that dude of the week. Number two, Frank Clark. Never too much. Never too much. Frank Clark just don't want to stop. And eventually gets the crucial sack on Deshaun Watson, but boy, <laughs> wow. he had to work for this thing right here. Let me show you this footwork. Clark uses the dip under rip move, but because he doesn't have leverage, because he's a little off balance right there, he has to go a little wider on the hoop. Now it's gonna cost you something. Sacks cost like 10 bucks. You put $5 on layaway right there. Okay, still need some money. You still owe some money. I gotta put another dollar down. Damn it, when am I gonna get to him? Get up, Frank, find that money. Ah, there he is, paid it off finally, man. Three attempts at the same player finally got him down. <clears throat> you are Frank Clark, number two, that dude of the week. Now let's go with number one, Zadarius Smith. Mm. Mm. Do your dance, do your dance. Flies off the edge and sack Russell Wilson. And then hits him with every damn celebration in the book. We're going to get to that a little bit later. I mean, you got to slow down, big dog. First, you got to set him up and sit him down. Ooh, came in with that. Set up move like he was going to go inside, counter with the outside swipe, Bruce Smith style right there, and even a clean hand to clean him off you. Now he's going to get to Russell Wilson. And here's where the real highlight starts. First, he's going to walk the damn dog. 
Then he's going to get there and feed the dog, okay? <laughs> then he's going to show how full the dog is, all right? And then he's going to clean the dog up. All right, big dog, that's a lot of moves right there, but you are that dude of the week. <laughs> all right, thank you, Marcellus. That was awesome. Let's move to Dallas, <laughs> <many> moves? <laughs> where Dak Prescott is scheduled to become a free agent, but reportedly could have already been under contract if he wanted to, according to the Fort Worth Star's telegrams, Clarence Hill, the OG. Dak and the Cowboys nearly agreed to a deal worth $33 million per year back in September, but the talks broke down after Dak got off to such a hot start. It was later reported that Dak was asking for $40 million a year. All right, uh, was Dak smart here to pass on $33 million per? Genius, genius, because look what occurred in terms of timeline. Dak is sitting there knowing that next year, 32.9 is going to be the franchise tag. Oh, so I thought it was 27. No, no, no. 32.9. That's what I read. Uh, we could read different things. But I saw 32.9. <laughs> so you're sitting there saying, I got that one in the bank. And y'all offer me $33 million before my career year? Hold on. On the Dak that we said was ordinarily adequate, as some people have called him, which I don't even know what that means, but just basically profoundly normal, he was offered 33. I wouldn't take that. Because now, if you play it forward, he had a career year. You play it forward now. You have turnover at the, at the coaching position. And now, you have March, until March, to make a move on the franchise tag, and more importantly, April 6th, for me to report. Dak holds all the cards, all the leverage. He's sitting there saying, you really brought in Mike McCarthy and a new system? And he's talking about how I'm a top-tier quarterback and we can do everything through me? And you're not going to have me report? Because I don't have to report if you franchise tag me. So now Dak is sitting there with all the leverage, with a, uh, sitting there with a floor of $32.9 million. I understand he doesn't have the long-term security, but trust me, when this deal gets done, it's going to be more than $33 million a year. It's not smart of him to pass. You, you can't, when you're a fourth-round pick, you can't pass this type of money up. $33 million a year. Now, you, you look at the, is he better than Russell Wilson? I say no. Is he better than Ben Roethlisberger? I say no. Is he better, better than Aaron Rodgers? I say no. $33 million a year. If I'm Dak Prescott, you take that. Now, you risk the chance of injury by not taking it. He didn't get injured. And how negotiations go? A lot of, Dak had a great year. Great. He deserves to be paid. But a lot of those stats, man, we're losing games. We're throwing the ball at the end of the game. The teams are giving us yards. They're fluff stats. They're not real stats. Mm. And so for me, he had a career year. But how many of those games and how many of these statistical great games that you had did it come in games that mattered, that we won the game? When we needed to win against Philly, what did you do? That type of stuff. 33 million, no. Is it smart of him to pass it? Absolutely not. He should have signed that. I think they need stability. And so because of that, and by they, I mean the Cowboys. Mm. And because of that, I think Dak Prescott is holding a lot of the cards. Mm. I think he's got leverage here. Yep. When things change, you want, you want similarities. You want touchstones. Even though Dak isn't going to be cheerleading for the former Jason Garrett regime, it's good for the locker room to have the same guy in place operating a different system. He's obviously trusted Kellen Moore to help him on to his career year. Like you mentioned, yeah, a lot of those stats he piled up were on the back half of losing games. They were an 8-8 eight and eight football team and wildly underplayed their, their estimates and their expectations this season. But there is no reason today, what is it, January 15th, 16th, for him to sign a deal? It doesn't make sense right now. I mean, you're, you have a bunch of chips in front of you. To use the poker analogy. You have a bunch of chips in front of you, and you just got tossed a soft hand. Hang in there. Fold on this one. Let's see what the next cards reveal. Maybe Not as a fourth-round pick. When you a fourth-round pick? The, the problem I'm having with the whole discussion is, at some point, we're going to have to have a meeting and all agree on the definition of great. <laughs> because... <laughs> Where are you going? I, I, <laughs> he had a great year. He I completely He disagree. had a good year. Good. Did you, uh -oh. He had you a good year. Wait, that's he had a great year. That's a different great year. No, went, uh, no, no. no. Wait compared up. to previous years, this year was great compared to and the previous And this is why three. I keep saying we need to have an agreement. We have to have a universal wow. Fox Sports <laughs> studio show. Everybody, Everybody. from Skip... Me. 
to Cal <laughs> Ever. You gotta agree on what great means because I just don't see great here, but maybe I just don't understand the definition of great. He had a good year. I just don't see mm. eight and eighteen. Mm. I, I I don't know who could say great I on can. eight particularly at the quarterback position. Maybe they got some linebacker that had 30 sacks or something. He could say great. But a quarterback, mm. great year, no, I can't go there. Then mm. I want to go to, he did have a career year. But so what? I, I, in 2019, in terms of weight loss, I had a career year. Oh, God. Does anybody care? Does anybody care? I mean, I got love for it. I I'm about to say, yes, we actually do. I can be I can do Keep that going, does not just, <laughs> That does yeah, not yeah. justify... They can pay, uh, but... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. That's my point. His career... Yeah. Like, that's Hold fine, on. Dak. Okay. You're supposed to do that. Yeah. Well, You're not supposed to be out here costing us games. I, I just told... I'm just sorry. <clears> I think <throat> this is a mistake. He's not worth $33 million. Mm. If I'm Mike McCarthy and him in there, I'm like, dude, let, let's run him out there a year with me on a franchise contract and see what this dude's really about before we commit long-term to Dak Prescott. You, you can't, in your career, great year. You go eight and eight, that ain't good enough for oh, me. Well, look here. Uh, Aaron Rodgers right now is feasting off a 13-3 and three year, and he had his third worst year ever. So it can go both ways this seesaw. Two-time MVPs. Uh, oh, oh, now we, I, I thought we said year. Now you when added you're an winning S. the game, you're you going to run years. the ball a little more than you oh, throw here it. we go. Wait, can we say this? Is this not great? Have you got, I don't know, I haven't. <laughs> Actually, maybe I Second in the NFL in, in passing yards and fourth in touchdowns. You know who was first? Jameis Winston. Okay. Hey, in, hey. In passing great yards. year for Jameis. That's why they thinking about bringing him back. Thinking Here's about it. it. Is, is Jameis they need to be no, doing no. here, thinking about it. Do you know Dak is fifth <laughs> all-time in passer rating? All-time, brother. You don't think there's some greatness attached to what Dak has done? Third in, in wins since he got to Dallas as a quarterback? Y'all, what an eight and eight year. Throw the eight and eight in there. And he's That's still what I'm third. saying. Ain't 33? You take that. No, you don't. Whoa, take whoa. That. I'm going to get mean, more look, than that. For Jerry, who's, you know, got more yesterday's than tomorrow's and wants to win now, and, and you're thinking about what they've built in, in, in Dallas over the course of the, the half century he's been in charge over there, you have to look at the point that they're at. This is very different than a rebuild. You don't want to bring in a new quarterback and start right. from scratch in some place. You know what you do? You don't pay the extra two or three million dollars. Do not exclusive franchise him and see, and see, let, and see if somebody is going to offer him more not, than 30. Don't put the exclusive franchise. Too disrespectful. Not, Carson Wentz, who is making 32 and a half million, who's only played one quarter of meaningful January football in his career. You and I it, both know when so, you're drafting the top five, things are different. Uh, and guess what? We're going to make them the same right now because <laughs> I deserve a million plus more than a guy who's not even played but one quarter of meaningful football for the Eagles. I just His team won the division. <laughs> Jack finished State and eight, not a playoff. <laughs> Mark Slareth and TJ Husmanzada are back with us. Time now for Darnell's question of the day. All right, take it away, homeboy. Yes, sir. Let's move to Antonio Brown, who made waves this week, posting a video of his confrontation with police and the mother of his children on social media. <clears throat> now the Police Athletic League in Hollywood, Florida, where A.B. lives, has announced they want nothing to do with the trouble wide receiver, releasing a statement saying, quote, we made, the, we made the decision to sever ties between Mr. Brown and the Hollywood Police Athletic League. We did not want our youth to be subject to this type of behavior, nor emulate the actions of Mr. Brown. We would not take money from a donor that we cannot have our youth be proud of or represent our organization. I want to ask you guys, mm. you think the NFL should publicly distance itself from AB as well? You know, I read this statement from the Police Athletic League, and I thought, like, damn, this should be the statement like the NFL should be making. Oh. And it made me say there is some value for the, <clears throat> for, the, for the NFL to publicly... I'm not saying they should do it, but if there, I think there is some value in distancing yourself from maybe particularly in this time. If he gets help and, and starts going a different direction, you can circle back. But right now, if I were the league, I would put out some public statements like, hey, we're not... Because people keep asking, what's going on with the investigation? What's going on with the investigation? Right. Right now, we're not interested in investigating in A.B. and completing this because he's just too much of a hot mess for us to even be involved with. Mm. To me, that would be grossly irresponsible of the NFL to distance themselves publicly from A.B. without going through the due diligence of this process. They've already slow played it long enough. Uh, they have to come down 
with a ruling. And I, I'm sure because of them doing their due diligence and not trying to leapfrog the judicial system, that they are slow playing this process. But let's discipline our eyes and focus in on why A.B. is at home and not on the NFL roster. It was because of the multiple accusations, not because of videos, not because of social media. Let's be real. The Patriots said they were caught off guard by the last accusation and the multiple accusations make the NFL take the stance of doing their due diligence. So if you're now going to use a relationship with the police athletic league and their flag football team and his donation as precedent or giving you incentive to do something, that will be irresponsible. The NFL needs to come down on A.B. as harsh as it can be. But make sure you make a ruling this offseason so that everyone knows what that future is, whether it's, it's a bad future or a good one. They pretty much have distanced themselves from him privately. He's not a member of the NFL. So to publicly say it, it he's, not a, he's not a player. He's just like us, a former player that played in the NFL. He wants to get back in and play. He's, dis- he's not in the league. The police league did what they did because of the way he was talking right. to the officers out there. And Tony, like, when I saw this, I'm like, bro, what, what are you doing? Why? Your sons are right there. Mm-hmm. That's their mother. Why are you talking to their mother? I don't care what disagreement you have with her. You don't talk to the mother of your kids in front of your boys like that mm-hmm. at that age because you, this is where you mold them. You don't want them doing that to another woman. You have a daughter. You don't want no man treating your daughter how you're treating another man's daughter. The NFL has already distanced themselves from him. He's not in the league. What they need to do is say, Drew, that's his agent, Drew Rosenhaus. If he wants to get back in the league, he Mm -hmm. needs to do this. And if he does not do this, it's curtains. You're not playing in the league anymore. That's collusion. But you can tell Drew that, and Drew can relay it to A.B., and either you fall in line or the NFL will keep rolling without you. Yeah, the NFL is interesting in that they won't say anything. They just, they, they'll just get to the point where they won't do anything. Hmm. And their lack of action yeah. should be all you need to know about your future in the National Football League. Listen, I, like, I had a conversation about Vontez Perfect. You know what bothers the league most of all about Vontez Perfect is the lack of contrition he showed for the hit he made. And the thing that really irritated him is he went off the football field after the hit that got him suspended for the rest of the year, flipping off the crowd. And they're like, you understand you went into this situation, understanding that you were on a very, very short leash when it came to your participation in this league. Antonio Brown, you understand that you are being scrutinized right now, um, legally scrutinized. We are investigating you. You are on, if you're not on your best behavior, you won't play in this league. And like you said, you can call it collusion or you can call it just money well spent from the owners. Like they're like, I don't need that guy representing my organization. I don't, I don't need somebody who is abusing, not only the, verbally abusing his, his um, children bu- and, and, you know, that his, it's not his wife, but that baby, lady. Baby, baby mama, mama, man. Okay. It's okay. Baby that? mama. Let it out. Yeah, baby Let mama. Out. Okay. I got one. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> no. But, I, I mean, it's you're real. verbally, it's a, it's a form of abuse. Yeah. What you did, and you're abusing authorities. You're abusing the police officers. Mm. Like, like they, they won't do anything, and that's okay. Guess mm. their prerogative. It is, yeah. I'll just say this. It's a television show, and I, I say that all the time. Yeah. And we've seen actors on television shows do things that aren't criminal, but things that, like, where the TV people are like, man, that's not a good look for the network. We don't want to be associated with that. And that, again, the Police Athletic League looked at this video and was like, whoa, we don't want to be associated with that. We're distancing ourselves from Antonio Brown. Antonio Brown. If, and the NFL, you're right, their actions are saying all that. I just think there could be a little bit of value in saying <laughs> we're distancing ourselves. If A.B. ever gets back to himself back together and wants to act in a way that brings honor to this league, we'd love to have him back. But until then, we've moved on. Mark Slareth and Rich Ornberg are back. Let's move to Cleveland, where the Browns introduced new head coach Kevin Stefanski yesterday. Reportedly, part of the reason the team hired Stefanski was because he agreed to some unusual conditions from ownership, 
including turning his game plan to owner Jimmy Haslam each Friday before a game. Haslam, for his part, called the report totally inaccurate. However, I'd like to ask, as we had this discussion yesterday in a commercial break, <laughs> would you have a problem with Jimmy Haslam if he wanted the game plan? Yes, I would. Um, I understand when you have ownership, obviously, you should have all of the permissions within that building to do whatever you please. It sounds good on paper, but in reality, are you going to review this game plan and comment on it? Because I doubt that you're just going to review it and never say a thing about it. So now, owner, you're going to get out of your lane and start talking about what is going on in this locker room when you should only focus in on what's going on on that football field in terms of results. The, the head coach doesn't walk upstairs after every game and say, how were the P&Ls this week? Uh, how was the gate? You know why? Because we know what we're there for. So what everything that comes in power is the proper use of it and the delegation of that same power. Trust in the head coach and let him do his job. As the owner, do yours. Yeah. You know, I like to defer to experts. I really do. I mean, when I need a shirt dry cleaned, I don't attempt to do it myself. I bring it to a dry cleaning business. When I need my taxes done, I don't do them myself because I wouldn't do them as good as an accountant can. And I also, I'm not going to sit there and ask them to give me their complete forensic reporting of every shirt and how they did the sleeve or the taxes for that matter. To a certain extent, there needs to be trust built into every business relationship, whether somebody is employed by you or in the employment of you. That's the reason why you hire experts. Jimmy Haslam is a corporate business owner. He's in charge and he should be an expert at delegating responsibilities to worthy people to run different areas of his business. And so that's as far as that needs to go. He doesn't need to see day to day. He hired an expert in Stefanski to handle day to day. You want to meet with him? No problem. But handing over his game plan, that would be like, I, I mean, I didn't go to <coughs> six years of accounting. You know, I didn't go to college to be a business major. Somebody else did that. So show me, right. show me the progress at the end of the work. I, I don't need the progress report necessarily. I, I would say this. What are you going to do with my game plan? Exactly. What are you going to Hey, man, okay. uh, 19 <laughs> handoff week. Um, you know, I don't know, but that uh, weak side defensive end, the right defensive <laughs> end is great at uh, setting an edge. And that weak side linebacker, man, and that, ru that run support corner they have on crack replace, I mean, <laughs> I don't know that we want to put 19 handoff week in this game. What, I mean, what are you – like I said yesterday, like, hey, man, if you want to talk to me – about traffic flow at a Flying J truck stop or whatever the hell you, you <laughs> operate, that, hey, that's great. Good for you. You want to know you, like what, what sells, the, what microwavable food at the truck stop sells the best? I'm all ears, brother. But don't tell me about football stuff. Hire people and empower people to do their job. When I played for the Denver Broncos, Mr. Bowen was down in the training room every Monday. You know what he's doing? Checking on his players and asking Mike Shanahan and Greek, our head trainer, what do we need? Who's injured? What do I need to go do to help you guys do your job? That was it. Wasn't asking for game plans. Jimmy Haslam, if he sees a game plan, he's not even going to know what he's Can looking at. I, I want to reread the question to you <clears throat> three because I think you've all misinterpreted. Would you have a problem with Jimmy Haslam? Yes. yes. Wanting the game plan. <laughs> yes. You all have stated you'd have a problem with him second-guessing the game plan. No, I said... There's no way he's going to review without commenting. And th since you're going to comment, why are you reviewing it? That's speculation. Why are you going? Okay. That's speculation. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll take it away from speculation. Yeah. Just the mere possession of that game plan. The fact that he's wasting time staring at Greek literature that he's never going to be able to decode <laughs> instead of being the best owner he possibly can be and deferring the expert that he hired to run this team is the reason why it's a ridiculous ask in the first place. The only thing I'm going to say, Rich, is I played football. I'm not that smart. These game plans aren't that hard to decode. <laughs> the other thing I'll say about owners, about owners and owning a business, and again, I always reduce things down to my dad. He owned a bar in the hood. <laughs> And again, the one thing you can't do to an owner is put them on a need-to-know basis. 
you, you, oh, <laughs> this is a need to know. <laughs> this is above your pay grade. Or you don't need to know. Owner means you're the owner, and anything the owner wants, he should be allowed to have. I think it's inoffensive. Now, if he was second-guessing the game plan and things like that, that would be problematic, perhaps. But because the owner participates in the hiring and firing of the coach, if the owner wants... And again, Jimmy Haslam says he didn't want this. But if he did, I just wouldn't have a problem with it. It's just more information. And then if somebody comes to him saying, hey, we want to fire the coach, he's got more information to participate in that discussion. Here's, here's the problem with that premise. The problem is this, is that if you're hiring a coach under those parameters, you're not truly empowering a coach. And when you don't empower a coach, you know what the players do in the locker room? They don't respect the coach. And when the coach isn't respected, you know what happens? You become Cleveland. <laughs> or the that, Cowboys. Right. Yeah. That's exactly what you become. You become a team that has gone to the playoffs, what, once? But uh, Since 99? I, I, I think y'all yeah. are just a little too territorial because you can get the game plan without second-guessing it, without involving yourself in it. I, 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 listen, I, I'm just telling you, at, at, everybody needs oversight. Mm. Everybody needs to answer to somebody. Mm, and we, sure. so a lot of times, we may or may not respect the people that have oversight over us. But they have oversight over us. We have to answer them. We have to explain why we're doing X, Y, and Z. I just don't have a problem with it. And to me, it's a little insecurity. It might, now, look, you, you're certainly going to run into a silly owner that gets the playbook, misunderstands it, uh, or the game plan misunderstands it, asks you a bunch of silly questions. You are opening yourself up for that. But you might open yourself up to a disciplined owner that would never come at you that way but just wants as much information when, as possible. When Jimmy Haslam took over, you know what he said? Mediocrity is no longer going to be allowed in this organization. Jimmy Haslam's organization would have to get tenfold better to even touch mediocrity. <laughs> <laughs> right? To even s take a sniff of mediocrity. So maybe the way you're doing it, it's wrong. Yeah, my thing is not that the, the owner can't be on a, a leash or need to know situation as you described. It's just like if we're going to run this ship efficiently and properly, why do you want to know? That's not utilizing our resources properly, which includes time as well. People always kind of skip past the time and just talk about the effort and the work and what are we doing in terms of spending and resources. How about I'm wasting time. I'm going lateral with my efforts just to make sure that you can sit there. And if you're not going to comment, why do I have to go through this, this gesture? I need either input or output. There's no such thing as no put. You're putting together a game plan for your whole coaching staff. He's, just give it to me. Yeah, sure. Just one more person you give that game plan to. But, mm -hmm. but the best owners, the best business owners in general are the ones who show great restraint, are the ones who can have power. And everybody looks and to And information. For, and they still show restraint. But those coaches There's are no doing doubt. something with that game plan. They're actually going to instruct those players. What is he going to do? All right, we got to go. Here's Before we go, <laughs> I'd like to offer a bit of additional insight on why NBA television ratings continue to plummet while other leagues have stabilized and the NFL's ratings remain robust. Some people mistakenly think I dislike the NBA. Not true. Professional basketball is my first love. My dad used to take me and my brother to Pacers games when they played in the ABA. Every year, I walked in on the first day of school wearing a fresh pair of Converse Dr. J's and an Afro that tried to mimic Darnell Hillman's. The Pacers are the only professional sports team that has ever brought tears to my eyes and tears of joy and sorrow. But the NBA is going down the same path as another childhood sports passion of mine, Indy car racing. There was a time when I could name the 33 car starting grid of the Indy 500 in qualifying order. Gordon Johncock, Tom Saneva, the Unser brothers, Rick Mears, A.J. Foyt, Johnny Rutherford, Howdy Holmes, Johnny Parsons, and Sheldon Kinzer were American legends to me. And then, sometime in the late 1990s or early 2000s, I couldn't pronounce or recognize the names of a lot of the drivers. I didn't know their backstories or their hometowns. I didn't dislike Helio Castroneves. He just didn't spark the same kind of passion or connection as Tom Saneva. The Indy 500 became a global event rather than a national and local one. I lost interest. Same thing is happening to the NBA. It's a global sport. The NBA brags about it. I don't dislike it. 
It just doesn't spark the same kind of passion within me and a lot of other hardcore American sports fans. Giannis Antetokounmpo and Luka Doncic are marvelous young superstars, but I don't know their neighborhoods or their backstories. They're not connected to the great American academic institutions like Indiana University, UNC, Duke, Kansas, Kentucky, UCLA. They're not American brands. Again, I don't dislike them. I just don't love them or hate them the way I did Reggie Miller, Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, Isaiah Thomas, and Patrick Ewing. Sports thrive off of fanaticism and passion. Familiarity breeds passion. As a kid, we used to visit my stepmom's family on the south side of Chicago, the same neighborhood that produced Isaiah Thomas. I couldn't find Luka Doncic's neighborhood on a globe or map if you told me the longitude and latitude. The NBA is losing traction in America for the same reason baseball did as it became more dependent on foreign talent. The same reason hockey lost traction in North America after the influx of Eastern European players. There's a price at home for globalism. American football isn't paying that price. Lamar Jackson and Joe Burrow are all American success stories that we can all easily relate to. College football and the NFL remain dependent on homegrown talent. I love it. I'm not ashamed of loving it. It doesn't make me a bad person for loving it. We got a bunch of idiots running around in this country trying to make people feel bad for taking great pride in America and American institutions. Don't be an idiot. Don't make the mistake the NBA made believing the grass is greener in China and that there's little value in letting players develop at American, American brands by partnering with iconic American academic institutions. Globalism is damaging the NBA. Nationalism is fueling the NFL. Speak for Yourself will be live at Loomis Park on South Beach as we get ready for Super Bowl 54. Audience check-in starts at 2 p.m. And we have special guests, audience giveaways, and a whole lot more. FS1 Super Bowl week, live from Miami, is less than two weeks away. Mm -hmm. All right, welcome back. Whitlock and Wiley, Rich Ornberger, and TJ Huspenzada are back. Let's move to Santa Clara, where Jimmy Garoppolo and the 49ers host Aaron Rodgers and the Packers in the NFC Championship on Sunday on Fox. Obviously, Rodgers has the superior resume of the two quarterbacks, but when they faced off in Week 12, Jimmy G clearly got the better of him. Rodgers was completely shut down while Jimmy G threw for 253 yards, two touchdowns, and a passer rating over 145, and the 49ers were dominant in a 37-8 victory. All right, the question is, who would you rather have this Sunday, mm. this Sunday, Aaron Rodgers or Jimmy G? Jimmy G. I know Aaron Rodgers' resume. Everyone knows that he's a future Hall of Famer, one of the potential GOAT candidates. But I'm going to show you something right now that gives me even more confidence in Jimmy G than Aaron Rodgers in this return visit to Santa Clara. Look at this right now. We're never going to confuse Aaron Rodgers as Mr. Payback because these are the teams that he faced in the regular season and saw him that same year. So he ain't playing playoffs. James Brown. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> His last five playoff losses have all come to teams that he saw in the regular season. Everyone probably were on shows like this. Oh, Aaron Rodgers going to get another crack at it. He going to get him. No, he ain't. Look at that. From 2012 to 2016, lost, 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 lost. And this is a game where he played his worst against them this year, 37-8, to 104 passing yards. Are we thinking he's going to buck that trend against that San Francisco defense? Sorry to say. Got receipts. It's Jimmy G. I, look, I like an experienced plane captain. You know, I don't want to get on a flight and have my uh, pilot say, hey, listen, you know, I've only done this one other time, but it went pretty good, and most of my <laughs> flight crew can really take the credit in the bows, but I landed the sucker. Aaron Rodgers is tested. He's a veteran. He's been in these postseasons. And I understand what you're saying about payback in the postseason. But I want a deft veteran hand guiding the ship when you get to the games that matter the most. Jimmy Garoppolo is a great story this season because it looks like John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan both with their big, long contracts are finally having that prove-it season and they're building around a franchise quarterback, a real talent in the NFL. But Aaron Rodgers has been there. He's felt the strain of being on the road in the postseason and getting victories. I trust the deft hand of the veteran pilot <laughs> landing this sucker really? as opposed to Jimmy Graham. So you would take experience even if it's bad experience? Bad experience. <laughs> okay. No, well, it's, experience. I, it's experience. Man, I'm taking Jimmy G in this. It's no question. Right. Like, 
Jimmy G can play like a Honda Accord, and his teammates going to make him look like he's playing like a Rolls Royce. Rolls. And it's <laughs> no question. If Rolls. Jimmy G plays bad, he can still win. If Aaron Rodgers plays bad, 20 for 33, 104 yards, they're getting blown out 37-8. We've seen that. Mm. The only way Jimmy G can... He got to turn the ball over four or five, six times, and they, prob- <laughs> and they probably will still win. Woo. Like, that, that's what he's working with. But, but, but why are we talking about the last time these two teams faced each other? It instead matters. Of, instead of the last week. It also matters what momentum you have. And Aaron Rodgers hasn't been asked to do as much as he has in the past on this Green Bay team, but he showed up and he got them that win in Green Bay against Russell Wilson, throwing all sorts of smoke at him. So I look at, at Aaron Rodgers – and the, the perspective we have rolling off of one of his more impressive postseason show-ups and show-outs in Green Bay, going to Santa Clara and getting the win on the road. Mm. Yeah, I'm not predicting a victory, but I'd rather have Aaron Rodgers for all the reasons Rich said. The guy's got the experience. He's the two-time MVP. He's the, mo- he's the more talented quarterback of the two. He's better than Jimmy Garoppolo. I'd rather have Aaron Rodgers. This is a no-brainer. What? Would I rather have the most talented? or the second most talented quarterback in the league other than Patrick Mahomes? Or would I rather have a guy that's played one playoff game and is still... Or would you have guys that's going to back football. him up, too? Yeah. Uh, 147 <laughs> yards. We just, we didn't, to we didn't, we just had to talk about Michael Jackson. We're not talking about <laughs> Tito and Jermaine. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Jimmy's here to help us talk about our approval rating for Luke Keekley. You! Now! Uh, first, who's your big dummy of the day? You. Man. Nah. <laughs> person to sit up and say, we're going to have to have a meeting at Fox to find out what's the definition of greatness. <laughs> Is it safe to assume that your name will be nowhere in that conversation? <laughs> All right, let's talk Luke <laughs> Keekley, That's cool. Who announced his retirement from the NFL yesterday at the age of 28. Keekley was a dominant force during his eight-year career, making seven Pro Bowls, earning five All-Pro nods, and winning Defensive Player of the Year, Marcellus. Keekly a Hall of Famer. Yes, he is. I know, short-lived career, but once you go over the threshold of six Pro Bowls or three All-Pros, pretty much. And with that dominant performance that he's been putting on year in, year out, consistency with those numbers, yeah, he's in. Yeah, Keekly is definitely a first ballot Hall of Famer. You know, I, I put it, not quite Ray Lewis, a cut above Brian Urlacher. Oh. Both those guys, okay. first ballot Hall of Famers. Luke Keekley, first ballot Hall of Famer. There it is. All right, Uncle Jimmy, uh, we talked some more Joe Burrow and the Carolina Panthers and my take that uh, they should go all in with Luke Keekley retiring. The Panthers should go all in on getting Joe Burrow. Wow. Your thoughts? I just figured out who you remind me of. <sighs> Phil McGraw. <laughs> Phil, you mean Tim Dr. McGraw, the country singer? Dr. Phil? What do you mean? There you go. Thank you, Douglas. Oh. Dr. Phil. Yeah, oh. my man. Hell, he want to act like he don't know who Dr. Phil is. <laughs> Hell, you know Dr. Phil, the Oprah knockoff? <laughs> you know, kind of like how everybody call you the Mike Stillborn knockoff? <laughs> <laughs> Mike Wilbon. You know? Mike Wilbon. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you and Dr. Phil come out here on a daily giving people advice <laughs> what they could have, should have, would have done with their life. Oh, hey, man. news flash, Fluffy. <laughs> Dr. Phil ain't no real doctor. <laughs> Just like you ain't no real NFL coach. <laughs> or general manager. Hell, you ain't even a former player. <laughs> oh, man. Look, but to let either one of y'all tell it, y'all got all the answers. <laughs> Hell, they can ask y'all something, but can't nobody tell neither one of y'all nothing. Mm. Hell, come to think about it, that might be why I can't stand neither one of y'all. <laughs> you know, let me tell you something. What? You that friend that always talk about somebody's hairstyle. <laughs> now, I could be wrong, but I know about six months ago, you ain't have a hair on your head. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Scandal. You, stupid. Huh? you always want to give somebody That's advice fair. about a relationship. <laughs> let me ask you a question. And I want you to be honest. What's the longest you've been in a relationship? <laughs> Three, four minutes? <laughs> Huh? You had the nerve to tell Uncle Jimmy when I got here. Jim, if you gonna be on TV, you gotta lose some weight. <laughs> <laughs> so you Jenny Craig now, huh? <laughs> Boy, you run around here giving out all this advice. How the hell you gonna tell, tell Joe Burrows, mm. the Carolina Panthers, 
anything about anything. Mm. It's my job, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You told this boy <laughs> to abandon his hometown, yeah. his state. Yeah. You know, it's just preposterous, man. <laughs> I'm serious. You know, the Bible say, he that half eyes, let him see. <laughs> Damn it to hell, I got four of them. <laughs> and I see how you left my ass back in Kansas City. <laughs> Darkless, I supposed to have been out here 10 years ago. Oh, like that with college. Yeah, but his ass talking about I should be grateful. <laughs> he grateful I don't bust him upside his head for leaving me to die in that jail. <laughs> <laughs> Look, that's why I got a problem with you talking about the Cincinnati Bengals being cheap. <laughs> hell, tell the world how you made me ride to Los Angeles in a bus. <laughs> oh. Yo, cheap bastard. Peter Pan. Damn. Ain't nothing Man. wrong with Greyhound. Man, uh, trust oh. me. Oh, yeah, I ain't say Greyhound. Uh, <laughs> nah, he, made, he, he made me ride spirit. Uh, my, <laughs> Luke Kinkley. I bus. had him in GOAT status. <laughs> bus. Uh, 23 job performance, yeah, 20 all timer. Yeah. Almost perfect character. He went to St. X. Great player, great person. 86 GOAT status. Yeah. Malcolm graduated from I the mean, game. almost perfect as a person and as a player. Respect for Luke Keekley and going out on your own terms, man. 98 GOAT status. Wow, you got him almost perfect. Almost perfect. Uh, the internet. Dude. Man, the internet. Went the all star. They mad. How they the hell, what are they doing? Y'all said he crazy. quit. <laughs>